Hi, welcome to My Favorite Mistake. I'm Mark Graven. Our guest today is Kimberly Milani. She's the director of the Ian O. in a Towich Institute for Leadership and co-founder of its Women's Leadership and Mentoring Program at the Ivy Business School in London, Ontario. She is co-author of the book titled Character, What Contemporary Leaders Can Teach Us About Building a More Just, Prosperous, and Sustainable wow. Future. So before I tell you a little bit more about Kim, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. No, it's great to have you here. I think this will be a really interesting discussion around on the book and, and character and, and leadership. Um, so I look forward to that. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about Kim. She is also the co-host of Sip and Speak, a webinar series that explores social justice issues from a gendered and intersectional perspective. Prior to joining Ivy, Kim spent 10 years as the director of the Circle Women's Center, a community-facing feminist center at Western's, is it Brescia University College? Yep. Brescia, yeah. Brescia University College. Um, she's also a founding member of the Institute for Women in Leadership at Brescia and was its director for seven years. Uh, Kim is, the gra is a graduate of the University of Toronto. Uh, Kim, thank you, you know, for, for the listener. I, I, I asked for Kim's coaching on a couple of words and I, and I didn't ask about Brescia. I should have just plowed through it, but I apologize for the mistake there. We tried to head off some of the mistakes, but I didn't get them all. All good. It seems to go well with the name of the show. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, Kim, uh, uh, on that theme of the show, um, people have heard my most recent mistake. I'm going to ask you the question we ask everybody here of the different things you've done in your career. What would you say is your favorite mistake? Yeah, you know, I got to say, this was a really interesting question to ponder, especially because of the favorite part. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of us tend to think of our mistakes, but we we ruminate on them and they're the ones that we don't tend to look back on fondly. Yeah. So uh, this was a, a really great challenge. So I appreciate mm -hmm. that. And sure. um, what I actually landed on was a mistake that I made that I didn't really realize that I was mix making at first, but mm -hmm. that really changed my, my path completely. Um, or actually perhaps rather than saying it changed my path, maybe it more redirected me back mm -hmm. onto the path that I wished to be on in the first place. Oh. And, and from which my life has really unfolded with, you know, an extraordinary amount of serendipity. Yeah. And um, so my mistake is one that I think actually many people have made themselves or can relate to. And that is entering university into an area of study where you aren't really passionate about it, mm -hmm. but it lays out a secure or and defined career path. Yeah. So for me, that was studying science for the mm -hmm. purpose of pursuing medicine. Yeah. Um, that was my mistake, not, but not my favorite part yet. Sure. Um, but you know, if I can back up a little bit to sort of explain the story, um, I was the kind of kid or young person who is highly intrinsically motivated and always mm -hmm. tended to strive for excellence or to be the best I could be, whether that was in academics or athletics or, you know, whatever. And this often meant that I found myself in positions of youth leadership, such as, you know, being the captain of my sports team, or I was on the mm -hmm. students council and things. And looking back, this was really the beginning of my understanding of leadership's power to impact those around you. And I really did enjoy the role and I enjoyed helping people or, or that's how at least I saw the mm -hmm. role when I inhabited it. Yeah. Now also growing up, I was an avid reader, like a complete book nerd. And it was my most beloved hobby. And my favorite stories were always rooted in mythology. I just mm. loved the magic of it. And I would even find books in the library about Celtic or Greek or Roman and other mythologies and devour those stories. And I was particularly enamored with Arthurian legend, uh, mm. which is a bit foreshadowing because it's Celtic in origin, which I also think most people don't realize about Arthurian legend. Oh. So back to what I yeah, that's yeah. a common mistake. Sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but we've yeah, uncovered no. it. It uh, is, it is. We don't so, tend to go back that far. We start, uh, yeah. you know, sort of from the, the, the Christian era and move forward, but uh, yeah. it really goes, it's much older than that. Mm -hmm. um, so when I started to think uh, about entering university and setting myself on 
uh, career path, the advice I received really was to be pragmatic, which is, I think, pretty typical of most mm -hmm. kids' experience. Um, I had good marks in all of my science courses. So I convinced myself through great encouragement from others to, ex to explore medicine as an option. And I felt kind of both a self-induced and an external pressure to enter into like a really respectable and tangible profession and one that had a clear pathway. Um, because of that leadership experience, I knew I wanted to help people in my career. So medicine kind of consoled me and enabled me to um, set aside the subjects I love, thinking that I would be able to do that th th you know, through that course mm -hmm. of, of study and, and career. Right. Um, so ultimately, you know, what it comes down to is I made the logical choice and not the passionate one. Mm -hmm. So now we're to my favorite part, which okay. is that I applied to and was accepted into the basic medical sciences program at the University of Toronto. And U of T, uh, in my opinions, and, and also by ranking standards, is one of Canada's best universities. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to disparage U of T science yeah. program because the program was great. But I really, I did realize in short order that it was, it was not for me, that it mm -hmm. would not give me fulfillment. And I was really struggling to engage wholeheartedly within the material, which was a little bit of a, an unusual experience for me because I'm kind mm, of somebody who right. dives into things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was at a real loss of, for what to do. And luckily U of T has a really, it's, it's one of Canada's largest universities. So it has an extraordinary number of programs right. and course offerings. So out of desperation one day, I literally grabbed the course calendar book, which I'm dating mm -hmm. myself. So it was at the time. <laughs> I, had a, I had a course calendar uh, course book too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So I grabbed it and I literally just opened it at random. Mm -hmm. And, and I can so clearly remember this. I was staring down at the first page of the section on U of T's Celtic studies program. Mm. And so I knew then and there that there was just something sort of visceral in terms of my response to that that that's mm -hmm. what I was going to transfer into. Um, so it's my yeah. favorite part and, and, and serendipitous in that that could only have happened at U of T because there was um, no other university in Canada at the time that had this program. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it does seem kind of funny because when I was thinking about this, I feel like most people listening to this story would think the mistake is going into Celtic studies and <laughs> and not going into medicine, but it was actually the other way around. Cause I, you know, you do hear a lot of what the hell are you going to do with a Celtic studies degree when you yeah. tell people that that's what you're switching into from medicine. There's a lot of very confused stares. <laughs> oh. um, but you, but, you, you've sorry, you've done ahead. a hell of a lot though. Right. So I mean, in response to that question, but yeah, so how, yeah getting, I think so. getting from there, to hear though, I'm sorry, I think you, you were about to continue, sorry. No, that's okay, that's okay. Um, I, th I think with the, the, some of the point I was trying to make, even though this is sort of like getting to be a long story, is I can't actually tell you how much use I've gotten out of that program, um, both from a literal standpoint, um, in terms of the program's content, mm -hmm. and also because of how it's shaped and actually continues to impact my views on leadership. Yeah. So um, Celtic mythology is really, like most mythologies, is really rife with lessons and examples of leadership from which we can learn. Um, yeah. But for me in there, there was a figure called Bridget that was actually, was in, and, and this is the one that continues to be profoundly influential. And um, it, it was particularly poignant to me because it's rare to have powerful representations of women's leadership but her mythology and stories really offered unique insights and perspectives that are actually still relevant today and that I actually think we need more of. Um, mm -hmm. These are examples of leadership that's really rooted in, in, in mercy and creativity and peace and a, and a deep, profound uh, wisdom. So um, following university, uh, um, after a few years as its coordinator and manager, as you said in my sort of bio description, I became mm -hmm. the director of a community outreach program called the Circle Women's Center, mm -hmm. and and Brusha, you know, at Brusha University College, which at the time was Canada's only women's university. Mm -hmm. And here I really engaged in work that 
sought to contribute to the discourse and work around women's rights and equality, human rights, indigenous reconciliation, sustainability, even entrepreneurship, and Mm -hmm. of course, leadership. And so within that experience, serendipity happened again. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to work with a scholar from Trinity College Dublin named uh, Mary Condren, who's Ireland's foremost expert on Bridget. So that figure I was studying during my degree and her and I worked alongside each other as well as an extraordinary group of women volunteers uh, to host what we called Bridget festivals for Mm -hmm. eight years. And that women from across North America traveled to attend. And um, these, these weekends were, were, they were immersive weekends Um, where we use Bridget as a metaphor and a role model from which women could learn and become empowered and emboldened and also become leaders in their own way. Mm -hmm. And these festivals, as well as essentially the other work that I did at Brussia over 15 years, the whole, the course of the whole period I was there really provided me with what I now recognize as 15 years of character development. Mm -hmm. It was really 15 years of deliberately tending to who I was and cultivating not just my skills as an employee, but my whole person. So really cultivating character dimensions such as my humanity and my humility and my sense of justice and judgment and transcendence. And, and, and of course, certainly my ability to collaborate. So being engaged there in leadership through this lens and experience also allowed me to recognize that Um, if we were going to change things for the better in our world, we really Mm -hmm. needed to have more women at the tables Mm -hmm. of power and decision-making and we needed more leaders full stop with strength of character to inhabit those positions. And so that's why when I moved on to um, Ivy at the business school, which was quite a different atmosphere than being Mm -hmm. at a, a small women's college, yeah. Um, the transition was actually pretty much seamless because it's really extraordinary that the scholarships that my colleagues had already produced at the Institute at that time really captured empirically mm-hmm. what I knew intuitively and experientially. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the fact that that character matters and it profoundly impacts our, our outcomes. Right. So, yeah. So, um, you know, we can go on into um, the character discussion, but uh-huh. again, like that, that, that piece from Ivy really also allowed me to, to, to learn a language with which I could talk about those 15 years of experience instead of sort of leaving it behind. It allowed me to translate and, and mobilize what I had learned there in a very unique and singular environment um, into a language that, you know, could connect with those more broadly and within organizations or politics and beyond mm-hmm. that. So, yeah. Ultimately, you know, for anyone listening, especially for young people if, if, who are listening, the lesson I learned and why it was my favorite mistake yeah. and that I would share is really to follow your heart and follow mm-hmm. your passions. I know that sounds a little bit cliche, but really don't fit yourself into a safe or expected or imposed box. And whether that's self-imposed yeah. or imposed by others. Mm-hmm. And actually what I thought was the logical choice was completely illogical for my own happiness and well-being mm-hmm. and success. And yeah. I would say that to others. So, you yeah. know, by following and doing what you love, you're on the right path. And mm-hmm. I think the other thing is 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 not you know, not thinking that you have to see the whole trajectory to the horizon. You know, right. you're, you're right. on the right path. And if you can't see around the corner, if you're doing what you love, I have no doubt that once you get there, you'll find like really exceptional opportunities that you didn't know existed. So yeah, that is my favorite mistake. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing those, those the story and, and the reflections. And, you know, we can only determine these things in hindsight um, because there could have been the mistake, things could have panned out of the mistake of, I don't know, um, you know, sticking to it, you know, yeah. stubbornly pursuing that initial path. And a lot of times people really struggle with staying with the safe thing, which mm-hmm. could be a mistake or following 
more of a passion, <clears throat> which could all also be a mistake. We just have to mm -hmm. make our best um, prediction mm -hmm. or try to figure out, you know, I appreciate that. It sounds like you, you, you pretty quickly realized, yeah, time to make a change without a lot of agonizing over it. Right. Uh, well, I, I, I recognized it pretty quickly, but there was a lot of agonizing okay. because, you know, and especially because I really, before I had that moment of opening up the course calendar, I didn't really know what I wanted to do because, you know, I, I in my head, identified myself in terms of that, that hobby as a reader or somebody who loved, like I loved English, studying English in high school and, and things like that. But, you know, again, and, and maybe this is more so then than now, because we didn't have, you know, I didn't have LinkedIn where there's, you know, thousands of people's job titles at my yeah. fingertips that I can see now. But, you know, then there was, it was pretty boxy that, you know, you're, you're a lawyer or a teacher or a police officer, you know, it was very, very typical. And so I didn't know what I would do if I went into a degree um, in the arts and humanities, mm -hmm. um, especially because I, I never thought of myself as a creative writer. So, um, you know, I, I still didn't know what I was going to do with a Celtic yeah. studies degree, but I thought, well, at least I'll get a degree and I'll love it and have yeah. the degree. And yeah. then I can, you know, figure out after that. So I was just, I just went in there with um, kind of some, you know, blind hope and, um, and really looked at uh, ensuring that I said yes to opportunities that came my way through that mm -hmm. experience. So one that, you know, main, still is, you know, really sticks out in my experience was I was fortunate enough to be given a scholarship to go to University College Dublin, which is the other university in uh -huh. in Dublin, uh, on a summer program for international students. And it was it was the last summer of the Orangemen's parades, and there was so there was still the troubles going on in Ireland and the mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of the the bloodshed and violence that was happening right. um, yeah. in Northern Ireland and. Uh, we had the experience of having two of their parliamentarians, one from each side of the fence, come from Northern Ireland to speak in our classroom about and, and pre present their position on why either Ireland should be united or why, it, you know, the North should stay as a part of the UK. And these were um, from their democratic parties, not the paramilitary parties, mm -hmm. obviously, yeah. even though we still had armed guards in our classroom and around uh, our building, which was a very odd experience, especially as a Canadian, to have guns anywhere around you at all. Yeah. And um, but they 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 were both very compelling. We you could see each side mm -hmm. of um, of their you could see their points of view and and they presented them in a way that was respectful to one another. So as we now see this devolution in discourse or in politics, right. it's a wonderful right. reminder that even in such an incredibly heated environment, like there was in Northern Ireland at the time, that respectful discourse mm -hmm. serves so much more of a purpose towards resolution than right. any type of violence ever would. Mm -hmm. And, so the, the the cap to all of that was the very last night of that program. We were in in a, a sort of a farewell party in a pub that the the, the school was um, throwing for us, and our professor came in, and that's the night they um, that's the night they announced the ceasefire. Yeah. So which has held since it led mm -hmm. to the Good Friday Accord and other things. So it was it to see in real time the playing out of what I would now recognize as these two leaders of character engaging in respectful discourse on, on peace um, and, and reconciliation issues essentially. Um, mm -hmm. And having it come to that type of resolution was a, just a profoundly impactful experience. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can only imagine. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the beautiful campuses I've had a chance to visit there in Dublin, but the, to have a, a more, like you said, powerful, meaningful, in, uh, experience like that, that is serendipity and a, a great mm -hmm. opportunity. And, you know, I think when um, I was going to ask, you know, what, before we, we talk more about character and, and the book and, and leadership, I was going to ask, I mean, I think, you know, you, you, you stated well, you know, you chose the Celtic studies degree and at least you would enjoy your time in college and you figure it out from there. I think that's, that's fair to say, uh, 
you know, um, that happens in, in life. Sometimes we, we can't have a crystal ball for mm -hmm. how careers have turned out. I'm a testament to, to that in different ways, but I mean, you know, did, did you think that a career in academia or, you know, in university related centers was likely, or I'm sure to your point now, people could search on LinkedIn, I bet Celtic studies and see people are entrepreneurs and leaders in different organizations. And there's all kinds of career paths that could follow. Yeah. Um, I didn't have a direct line of sight to that. I actually didn't mm -hmm. quite know. Um, we were a whole department, so it wasn't really even an, an emerging out of an institute at the University of Toronto. So I didn't have a line of sight to a kind of a role like mine. But I, I was always um, also enamored with university life. So mm -hmm. it it did make sense to me that my life has ended up within the realm mm -hmm. of academia. Um, although I'm highly action oriented. So the role that I have now is, um, is essentially the perfect fit for my disposition, which is taking, um, I'm not a researcher. Mm -hmm. So, um, all the deep research uh, on character has been done by my colleagues, but what I love to do is take that research and translate it and mobilize it for practitioners mm -hmm. because, you know, there is absolutely no sense in having excellent scholarship coming out of any university in any field or discipline and not having it impact the public. Yeah. You know, the, the, it, it serves no purpose um, other than, you know, you know, maybe to sit in, in a small box where only mm -hmm. a few people enjoy it. So, um, and especially, you know, because I am passionate and really believe in the work that we do on character, mm -hmm. it, it's it's really um, gratifying for me to to straddle sort of the academic and practitioner worlds and, and bring uh, what we do to different audiences. Yeah. Last last comment I was going to make about your story and and, and choosing um, a degree program. You know, it's probably a good thing. Uh, your finger didn't go towards civil engineering, which might have been right near Celtic studies in the book. Oh, it's a it's a very good thing for me personally. Um, me, that would have, been, would have been a mistake for me too. Yeah, that would have been. I would have just shut the book and thought, "Oh my gosh, what am I going to do?" And I don't know where things would have ended up. But yeah. thank goodness it didn't. And uh, you know, it is funny. Just as a, on a, a a small last note, I am flying out on Friday back to Dublin. Um, because now our institute is working with Trinity, um, with their uh, Trinity Business School, because they've uh, become intrigued by the work that we've done on character. And they have a wonderful uh, body of research on uh, responsible leadership through the lens of human rights and sustainability. And so we are going to collaborate to look at how we can um, fuse our two areas of, mm -hmm. of scholarship into programming that, you know, that benefits uh, leaders and, and whatnot. So there seems to be this, this cycle in my life that continues to return me uh, to Dublin uh, at various points in time, which for which I'm, I'm very grateful. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. great. So again, our, we're joined by uh, Kim Milani, the book, uh, she's the co-author of the book, Character, What Contemporary Leaders Can Teach Us About Building a More Just, Prosperous, and Sustainable Future. Um, I mean, you know, let's start with, I'm, I'm sure you define this in the book, the word character is a word we all know or we, we hear. We might have different definitions of it, or how, how do you define the word and, and maybe building on that, what is character-based leadership? Yeah, that's a great question. So you're right. It's a word that we are we all sort of know, but we do not have a, a common understanding of or concise definition, which actually has been a little bit of the issue that's been yeah. identified through our research. So, you know, from from a, a very overarching perspective, character really is a part of the fabric of our being. It's who mm -hmm. we are. And um, but what we want to do is is really be able to to unpack it and dissect it and so one of the first things we needed not only was a definition but a language with which we could come to talk about it because we did not have a consistent language a surrounding character and especially in the workplace sometimes there's language around character which taps into virtues that perhaps people explore through either their spiritual traditions or through philosophy or things like that. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about having this set in a business school and how it impacts leadership, there wasn't that common understanding and, and common 
language. So, you know, in terms of a concise definition, we really define character as an interconnected set of virtuous behaviors, which mm. I know sounds a little bit like a mouthful. But yeah. um, so, of course, what I mean by virtuous here is really these are these are beha- virtues are behaviors. And so mm-hmm. they're behaviors that are beneficial to yourself and to others and to society. Mm-hmm. So, you know, to drill down a little bit further, uh, my colleagues at the Institute had created a, um, a which is still forms the foundation of everything we do at our Institute, created a character framework. It was mm-hmm. based on years of research, unique and novel research with thousands of leaders across the public and private and not for profit sectors both in Canada and the US, but also in the UK and Asia and elsewhere. And this framework captures how our character um, is made up of 11 different, we call them dimensions because we found in organizations that the word virtues just doesn't sit well. So we need to use language that people will use. So Uh 11 different dimensions that interact and influence each other. So to be specific, those 11 dimensions are Uh um, accountability, Mm-hmm. Collaboration, courage, drive, humanity, humility, integrity, mm-hmm. our sense of justice, mm-hmm. our temperance, and our transcendence, which is sort of our ability to be optimistic and visionary, sort of future mm-hmm. orientation. Mm-hmm. And all of those dimensions kind of constellate around the central dimension of judgment. Judgment, mm-hmm. if you if you look actually at Uh, our framework, like the physical representation of our framework or the graphic representation of our framework. It Mm -hmm. is a series of of circles around a central circle of judgment. Sometimes it's colloquially call it the wheel. Um, Uh So there's, that's what it, what it looks like. Yeah. So, And and, and what you mean, just clarify is generally having good judgment as opposed to, you know, you, you probably, you don't mean judging others being not no no having good judgment judgment. yes so um again in other language that we're we're, we uh we we tended to we we didn't shift towards organizations we used actually the language that we were provided by the leaders that we did the research with but Mm -hmm. in philosophical terms aristotle would have called it practical wisdom because we did go back after we collected that body of novel research we did go back and look at um um, Aristotle and the, the Confucius and other philosophers and moved in through all the way through to positive psychology and other aspects like that. But so, but yes, practical wisdom, judgment, our mm-hmm. own judgment, not judging others. And um, so essentially that's, that's what character is. And, but, you know, it's, so it's not this amorphous thing. It's something that's actually revealed mm-hmm. and manifests through our decision-making and then obviously our subsequent actions. And yeah. uh, I think it's, it's, it's important though, just to, to note that, um, that I don't just mean major decisions that we sit and reflect upon. I'm talking about the mundane little everyday decisions. one of my colleagues calls it in the micro moments that mm-hmm. we make every day that add up to become a part of our habitual behavior because yeah. character really is a habit mm-hmm. of our being. So. Yeah. 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 Um, do do you think um, do how how much do people have a sense? Or this this probably varies from people to people, person to person. Do they have good judgment about who has, if you will, high character? If they're evaluating a job or they're thinking about switching departments to go work for somebody else, like how much of that character can only be evaluated through observing somebody's behavior and decisions over time? I think a lot of it can actually, um, that, you know, so, uh, you know, again, within the framework and the research, we, we, we unpack those 11 different dimensions with 62, what we call elements, which are observable behaviors of how those dimensions manifest in people. So you absolutely can observe it, you yeah. can assess it, and you can actually measure it. We have wow. a psychometric where we can measure you can, you know, you can engage in a self-assessment so you can measure your own character. And of course, you know, the psychometric will give you, you know, tools and and whatnot and results that Mm -hmm. um, can help you uh, further to develop that or there's 360s. But I mean, this is something that is quantifiable. 
um, yeah. because it is observed through behavior. Now, you know, I suppose in terms of, you know, people making judgments about trust, you know, invoking like trust that we have in others or, you know, their, their sense of others. It depends on how long you're able to observe the behavior. Some people can put, you know, a bit of a facade up that maybe doesn't give you an accurate reading, but over time, you know, our character does reveal itself, especially mm -hmm. if you're someone um, you're able to witness people in pretty crucible moments, so, you know, oftentimes crisis really reveals, you know, mm. people's character. It, it's not the only time it's revealed, yeah. but um, you know, when the chips go down kind of thing. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, you can absolutely yeah. can see and observe yeah. it. Is it fair to say that people with character and, and good judgment are still going to make mistakes, but can be, you know, from that list of 11 dimensions, for example, humble about it, accountable, honest about having made a mistake? Absolutely. So, yeah. you know, you completely nailed it because none of us are perfect. So even people with strength of character are, you know, are going to make mistakes. The fact is, is that, you know, when you have strength of character, you do have that humility to acknowledge the mistake and, and to learn from it. So mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're, you unpack that mistake to say, where can I do better next time? or you're accountable to, mm -hmm. you know, you own up to it, you accept responsibility for that and, and take ownership and yeah. things like that. So that that's the difference between uh, when, you know, this isn't about being perfect. This right. is about, you know, this is about actually just striving for excellence um, within your life, understanding that the achievement of excellence comes on a path that includes mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what you described there, makes me think of the, the all the previous guests on this podcast. We could almost call it the high character show because not a single guest has come on here and blamed other people for the decision that they made that turned out mm -hmm. to be a favorite mistake. Now, there could have been other people involved, but you know, I think when, when I started, um, I didn't know exactly how those conversations were going to go with people on this topic. And, you know, thinking back on it after a while and reflecting, like how, how, how refreshing it it is for people to say, yes, uh, uh, I, I, made a, I made a mistake. I reflected on it. I've learned from it. I've tried not repeating it. I want to help others. I mean, those, those seem to line up with um, most, if not all of the dimensions in, the, in that character framework. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, what, as, as if we're, you know, if we have a leader in a position who, who does make a mistake and owns up to it, instead of eroding trust, you know, depending on the nature of the mistake, but it, uh -huh. it actually can serve to build trust, right. which is really important within our organization. So, um, yeah, um, it, it, you know, I would, I would say that it's, it's those with perhaps weaker compromise character that are, mm -hmm. are deflecting, um, yeah. their, their mistake onto other people or blaming other people. Yeah. And when, when you talk about how character is, the fabric of, of who we are, it, maybe, I mean, does that take shape like other aspects of development by the time we, we reach early adulthood? I mean, I guess my question is how much is character, perhaps nature or nurture, can it be developed over time? Or do we sort of reach a point to where generally, yeah, we are who we are. I can think of some figures in, in American public life where you think, no, they are who they are and they've been that way for a long time. I wouldn't expect them to suddenly develop character, but maybe in less extreme situations and, and younger people. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, I have no idea who you might be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> your smile suggests we might be thinking the same person, yeah, but you, know how much you may or may not want to lean into that, but... Uh, you could answer this very generally if you like. Yes, uh, I can lean into that, but I'll, I'll answer more generally to start with. Mm -hmm. um, so we do a lot of work dispelling the myth that character is innate, um, either something that we're born with or that's set at actually an early age. So character is absolutely not born, it is built. So it's in the nurture camp, but the nurture of our whole life. Um, so. Uh, you know, some people do just, you know, as a side note, kind of confuse character with personality, and they're mm -hmm. not exactly the same. Personality sure. does to tend to have sort of more innate or stable variables, you know, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, for example. 
Um, but regardless of, regardless of that personality type, um, you know, whether you're say an introvert or extrovert, that doesn't mean that you don't possess the capacity and the dimensions of humility or humanity or an integrity that, that that's and so character is, is, is separate from that. And, yeah. um, uh, so I think it, it's really about, um, understanding this, this, this building, um, aspect of our own character. Mm -hmm. And, um, so a lot of times what we do is actually, we really liken character to, um, uh, to, to have to sort of create a, a great metaphor for it. Character is a, a muscle. Hmm. It's something that you, you strengthen every day. Mm -hmm. Should you, well, no, it's, it's something that needs to be exercised every day uh, mm -hmm. to be strong. So like a muscle, our, our character, so can atrophy mm -hmm. if it isn't extra exercised. So right. just like, you know, if we decide we're going to, you know, if we were super fit and we become a couch potato, we don't stay mm -hmm. super fit. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with character because actually because of character's central role in judgment and decision-making, our character is actually being exercised for better or for worse mm. every single day. Mm. So really the trick of it in terms of character development, what we would look at as character development is bringing consciousness to it, being mm -hmm. intentional about your development. Yeah. So, because a lot of times people um, tend to not think about that mm -hmm. and they, they go through their, uh, their life and their character develops as a consequence of perhaps their surroundings, whether it's the context they're in, you know, socioeconomically, geographically, within their family dynamic, their faith tradition. But you need to you need to create um, an intentionality to it and exercise it deliberately should you wish to strengthen particular aspects of yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's something that. Um, um, it, it tend, there tends to be some light bulbs that go off when, you know, when we're doing uh, workshops and other things like that about, about like, oh, you know, so we, we often deliberately invest time in developing skills, mm -hmm. whether that's, you know, a, a professional skill, um, you know, learning, a, you know, a new element to our job, whether it's something like learning an instrument or learning a new sport, we invest in our skills, we understand that we need to do that to get better. But we just tend to not really bring into our mind about developing those aspects of our character. And, but once people really actually understand that it, it, it impacts and manifests through our judgment, then they start really seeing the, how consequential it is. So, mm -hmm. um, so we really encourage people to not have their own character be a residue, sort of the remnant of what's left of what they do in their life, but have it be um, essential because it's mm. a part of your essence habit. Mm -hmm. So not be residual, but to be substantial. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the subtitle of the book, again, the, the, the book is character, um, what contemporary leaders can teach us. So what, what are some of the best examples of character, best leadership, um, that, that we, we can and should learn from? Well, so leadership is always contextual. So, mm -hmm. um, so what we need to learn and, um, you know, that will have a direct impact on our own life is one thing, but looking at, you know, uh, of, of leaders of a strength of character certainly can then just inspire us to dive deep within ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we often, one of the most, common workshops we do with our students is um, using the story of Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. So, you know, pretty, and, and, you know, if you um, just in short, even if you, if you watch the movie Invictus, which mm -hmm. has, it, it was, is a really excellent movie combining leadership, sport and character. Mm -hmm. um, you see, you know, if you have our framework in front of you, you can see how he manifests all those different dimensions of character within his judgment and decision making. You know, so he is exceptionally transcendent. So he uses, for instance, the hosting of a sporting event, the Rugby World Cup, as a way to unite the country after exceptional division, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from the apartheid era. Um, he, he's accountable 
to not only the black voters that voted him into office at the time, but to every citizen of that, that country, because he's trying to build, build something within which everyone flourishes. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's very collaborative, um, and, and uses the, the leadership of others. So, you know, in this case, you see, for an instance, the leadership of Francois Pinar, who's the captain of the, the, the rugby team in South Africa, but he uses the leadership of others to, to, to fuel into a dream. So, I mean, I think, I think having these, these role models can be really inspirational and you, and it can allow us to see, um, character in action. You know, because some of the hard part is translating theory into action for for some people. So, you know, when we use, so this is why actually we really wanted to um, write this book. So even though the first two chapters uh, have a very high level and accessible explanation of the research that came out of the Institute, we really wanted to use stories and storytelling yeah. as a vehicle for having people see what character looks like in action. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I use the example of Nelson Mandela at this time, but, you know, obviously I would also say any of the 17 leaders within our book that we interview from so many different sectors and, uh, you know, demographics um, are, are also worthy of review because we can, we, it, it, we can find like gems that we can then transform into actions that apply to our own life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's probably also cautionary tales, examples of business leaders who um, might have otherwise been successful, but a lack of character could lead to their downfall. It could be a lack of character in how they treat other people. Um, it could be a lack of character in terms of um, honesty or making you know, selfish business decisions that don't benefit others. And, and, you know, I think the one thing that's tough is, uh, like it's, it seems like there, there may be, there, there are leaders who succeed in spite of character issues or a lack of character. And that almost leads some people to say, well, see, oh, character is not that important. Right. Or, or maybe some people would say they don't care about character. Um, I don't know if there was a question in there, but I'm curious of your, your thoughts, you know, uh, around any of that. Yeah. You know, we, we get that at times cause there's a, you know, a few high profile leaders in that way, but you know, first of all, I would ask people to question what their definition of success is. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think that that, that matters. And if success is just that they uh, are wealthy or have a positional title, then I wouldn't, that, that wouldn't, for me, that wouldn't quite equate to my own personal definition of success. Mm -hmm. And I also think it's su success at what cost, sure. because one of the things we, I think is important to remember, especially as leaders, is we profoundly impact the life of others. Mm -hmm. And so, sure, maybe they're successful, but at what cost and mm -hmm. to whom and to what? You know, we are in a climate crisis right now because, quote unquote, successful leaders have profited Mm -hmm. off of the environment for so long to the detriment of now, not only the planetary world, but the very real human impacts that's happening. Right. So I think, I think it's a little bit narrow to mm -hmm. look at leaders and think, oh, well, they're successful. Um, but it's like, are they really? Because to me, as a leader, you know, as leaders, whether we like it or not, we create a legacy. Mm -hmm. And some of these people's legacy is not going to be one that is looked back on as successful. It's going to be one that's harmful. Right. And I think there's many of leaders that we now look back on with that lens and think, mm, you know, maybe that wasn't the case. Um, the other thing I just also wanted to quickly note in terms of like the, the lack of character you know, which is fine as an overarching phrase, but mm -hmm. it's often not a lack of character wholly or holistically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Often because of, so all of those dimensions, for instance, they interact and influence one another to form our judgment. So a lot of times what we find is that leaders are strong in some dimensions of character, but they're weaker in other aspects of character. And so then it, it uh, compromises their judgment. So, sure. 
you know, for instance, uh, one that's just, you know, a lot of this research was found out of the 2008 financial crisis, where mm -hmm. a lot of times we saw people that had a high amount of courage and a high amount of drive, but they maybe lacked temperance, like knowing when yep. to put the brake on mm -hmm. and maybe some integrity and mm -hmm. therefore wow. it compromised their judgment. Now, yeah. if they had strength and temperance and integrity, they could move forward with some of those actions that their courage and drive were, um, uh, you know, propelling them towards. And it would maybe be in the realm of innovative risk taking or mm -hmm. such. But when yeah. you don't have, so that's why we really actually encourage people. This is not strength based leadership where you mm -hmm. play to your strengths and you delegate you know, the parts right. that you're not so great at to others, you cannot delegate your humility to somebody else. Or, or integrity. <laughs> so, or your integrity. Yes. Yeah, so, so we really encourage people to think about the development of character holistically. So each of those dimensions. And so, and just to do, to do that, you have to do that. So we become courageous by doing courageous things. Mm -hmm. You know, we become humble by engaging in acts of humility. Yeah. And um, so we have a whole bunch of different, what we call exercises. My 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 one colleague kind of uh, jokingly calls it our, our character gym. Um, so yeah. that helps to develop those aspects right. of ourself and bring, bring self-awareness, which comes back to, I think the person that we might've been referring to um, who I would consider to have a huge lack of self-awareness. Yeah. <laughs> and um, which is why we think he's never going to change, right? Yeah. Because there just is no sense of self-awareness that would propel him to want to do that or inspire him to want to yeah. do that. Yeah. And a minute ago when you, you talked about as we start to wrap up here, um, we become humble by acts of humility. And, and I, this is a pet peeve. Um, uh, you see people online, um, announce and share that they've won an award. And that's great. Like, but then they'll say like, I'm, I'm humbled and honored to receive this award. And I'm like, I think you're, you're feeling honored. Like what's, <laughs> what's, what's humbling is not winning the award when you thought you should, or what you'd think would be humbling would be, you know, losing an election, you know, I mean, right. Well, it can be, but you know, if you look at some of the behaviors under, um, under humility, one of them is is gratitude. So mm -hmm. I think actually winning an award can be a humbling experience if you have yeah. the self awareness, because that's also under humility, to yeah. sit and reflect and think, I've won this award and this accolade, and look at all of the people behind me in my life that contributed mm -hmm. to me getting here, and yeah. I'm extremely sure. grateful for that. So I think it depends mm -hmm. on how. You, it, it can also be humbling to lose an election for sure, but yeah. it's it's about um, engaging in character and within these these behaviors in a, in a different way than sometimes how we we throw about the words. So if it's just sort of you know it's kind of like the thoughts and prayers you know mm -hmm. sort of adage. Oh, my thoughts and prayers are they really with you? Yeah, I don't know. Right. We're just yeah. saying that you know. Right. So are you just as humbled and honored become just a colloquialism that's or a platitude, yeah. you know, as opposed to somebody, when you deeply engage in, in reflection um, yeah. um, for that purpose. No, yeah, that's a really good point. So yeah, it could be, it's, it's an expression that maybe is intended to soften sort of the, what might come across as bragging. And again, I'm not saying sharing that you won an award is bragging, but um, but maybe it, maybe it just softens it to, to say, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I'm I also think so. humbled, okay. I, so I think I've been wrong about that. Um, I think I'll humbly <laughs> submit. I'm going to stop cringing when when I see the word humbled related to success because I you you make a really good point there. Um, mm -hmm. One one last last question. Um, when you talked about you know creating a legacy, um, I often point to a leader I had good fortune to meet a few times. He passed away a couple of years ago. Um, Paul O'Neill, who had been the CEO of Alcoa um, for about 14 years, and one thing I remember about him is the stories, and I've seen a photo of the notepad. When when he took the job as CEO of Alcoa, he had a notepad and wrote down across the top as he was thinking through his plans or what did it mean to be CEO. What Basically, what sort of legacy do you want to leave? And he decided that legacy was not uh, profits above all else and the stock price legacy. The first thing he wrote down was employee safety, and he mm -hmm. had the integrity to follow through on that being a priority for the company that you know dramatically drove down um, employee injury rates, but also led to quite a bit of success for the company. Right. You know, so I, I think of that as an example of 
high character. The question I was going to ask, though, is do you think that's a helpful exercise to, to think through and write out whatever stage we are in our life or career to answer that question, what do you want your legacy to be? Absolutely. So, you know, in, in terms of one of the exercises that we actually prescribe within some of our workshops and within the works we do is we have people write their own obituary mm -hmm. because it's really important when, when people start looking at in terms of legacy. So what do I want to leave behind as opposed to what do I want to do next? It mm -hmm. shifts their vantage point. And it is yeah. very, very rare that people want to say the legacy that I want to leave behind is a full bank account in a big house. Yeah. You know, they want to leave behind a legacy that makes people's lives better or makes something better. Gen generally, that that's what we find, whether whatever their, you know, sort of their passion or area is. And so I think it's a really, um, a really valuable uh, exercise to go through to not only figure out what you want your legacy to be, but then to take that and you can start from where you are and sort of reverse engineer. So if that's what you want your legacy to be, then you can go into, okay, what do I want to do next? Mm -hmm. Cause it might shift that, that, that pathway. And yeah. so, um, absolutely. I think that's um, a great lesson that you learned early on from that leader that you, um, uh, were exposed to. And, uh, I would encourage anyone to do it. Yeah. And do I have the character to apply the lessons learned? So I will keep yeah. working at it. Yeah. yeah. Or what? Yeah. Oh, and that's the other part is you can you can take that exercise and think, okay, if this is really what I want my legacy to be, what dimensions of character do I mm -hmm. need to exercise to be able to do that? So you know, some of that might be courage, you know, like w you might be stepping into an arena that is really unfamiliar or is maybe daunting or what have you, or, you know, it could be something else like increasing your, you know, your sense of justice and expanding mm -hmm. your knowledge about, uh, uh, you know, about the, the injustice that's in the world, what have you. Um, but, you know, that's a way you can start. And because a lot of people don't know where to start in terms of character development, they're like, where do we start? Sometimes, you know, we will say, look at the framework. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know where to start at all, just start with what's what makes you the most curious. Because, mm -hmm. you know, um, we also encourage starting with self reflection. Mm -hmm. um, because you have to have that self-awareness. You have to know kind of where you're at. So if you're not going to do a psychometric like we have, you need mm -hmm. to start with some honest self-reflection and um, self-reflection for the point of introspection. So for the point yeah. of improvement. And then after that, yeah, mm -hmm. if you do this this legacy exercise, um, you know, ha have a think about mm -hmm. what it is you need to um, sort of strengthen within yourself to be able to accomplish that. Yeah. That's very well said. Um, introspection, not rumination, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Rumination does nothing but fester inside yeah. of yourself. Introspection propels you forward. That's very well said. So again, our guest today, uh, uh, Kim Milani, uh, the book is Character, What Contemporary Leaders Can Teach Us About Building a More Just, Prosperous, and Sustainable Future. I will make sure there are links in the show notes uh, to the book, to Kim's website and, uh, and more so you can learn about the book and the framework. So Kim, thank you so much for a really interesting, thought-provoking discussion and thanks for sharing your story. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.